everyone, I'm Shelley Till, and welcome to this edition of Tri-State Report. This is a program brought to you with the intent to discuss the impact and the response of COVID-19 in Dubuque County and beyond. And today I'm very excited to have with us our two guests. Um, first, we have Kristen Dietzel, and she is from the GDDC. She's the Vice President of Workforce Solutions as well as Kevin Lynch, who is here as president of the Dubuque Initiatives. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for being here. Hi, Shelley. Good to see you again. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Wonderful to see you. And uh, the times we're living in require us all to get together in these virtual uh, meeting rooms. So I'm sure you're uh, accustomed to this. So viewers out there that are watching, you know, you may hear some interesting noises in the background and that's okay. It's 2020. <laughs> we're all going to have great stories to tell. Um, I wanted to start off by, with you, Kevin, um, as the president of Dubuque Initiatives, for people that are not familiar with that organization, can you just give us a little bit of uh, information about how it was formed and, and what the purpose is? Yes, absolutely. Dubuque Initiatives has actually been around for many years, uh, going back to the uh, early 80s, and uh, it is a private nonprofit board of directors, and our mission is to help the city to create and retain jobs uh, and taking on uh, whatever tasks that might entail. Uh, could be jobs that the uh, public sector is simply unable to take on and the private sector may simply be unwilling to take on. So that's where we would enter into a, an economic development kind of situation. And when the, uh, the COVID-19 situation came around and uh, it became uh, such a desperate situation since we have so many local small businesses that are struggling mightily right now, we decided uh, to discuss it and, uh, and I'm very proud of our board that we were willing to be able to step up to the plate and do what we can to help some of these small businesses. And we're gonna to get to uh, what specifically that entails, but first Kristen, uh, for viewers who might not be familiar with you and your role and even GDDC, give us a little summary. Sure, so Greater Dubuque Development is an economic development group. Um, we are a private nonprofit. We are funded both by the public sector, but two thirds from the private sector, and that comes from existing businesses. So. Um, we serve the existing businesses in our community through a number of missions. Um, the one in particular that I work on is workforce. So um, my role is really to ensure that our employers have the workforce they need now and into the future to make sure that they can grow, expand, and thrive here in the greater Dubuque region um, versus somewhere else. Um, we also recruit new business to the area um, in addition to working with our existing business base on expansions. Very good. So we're going to get into how the, the two of you are, are collectively working together with this. But Kevin, um, so we, back to the COVID-19 bridge fund. Uh, there's a lot of different funds and, and drives and uh, things going on in the community, in the state, in, and federally. It's really confusing for a lot of people. So can you tell us? specifically what the COVID-19 Bridge Fund is and who, what the purpose is and who can benefit from it. Sure, and you're absolutely right, Kelly. There are a lot of options out there, uh, and a lot of them, I think, stem from the desire that people have to try and help everyone that's struggling right now, uh, which is certainly where our bridge loan uh, program came from. Uh, when it became apparent that uh, the federal and state uh, assistance funds for small businesses just simply was not going to be able to um, fill all the needs that, uh, that were there. Uh, we decided to go ahead and uh, put uh, some definition on how we could help some of our uh, local businesses. We can't save everybody, obviously, but we can uh, certainly help some of them. And so, uh, we decided to set aside a fund of $2 million. We uh, made uh, some very light uh, requirements. Uh, they have to be a small business of 50 or fewer employees. They have to be located in the city of Dubuque, and they should be uh, in engaged in part of the uh, process for uh, obtaining funding through the PPP program or the EIDL program, uh, which, as you know, uh, both got cut off yesterday. 
uh, or a lack of funds. So um, our plan was to allow these businesses to make application using the, uh, the hotline that uh, Kristen is, is uh, overseeing and, uh, and talking with personalized counselors there uh, with the help of ECIA, who has been very gracious in stepping up to this as well. And uh, we give, uh, they're, they're able to apply for uh, up to $10,000 of bridge funding uh, so that they can pay their bills, pay their rent, their mortgage, pay their employees, uh, you know, the things that they need to uh, take care of because obviously uh, no money's coming in the door, but the bills continue to keep coming in. So uh, this is intended to help them. Then when they get their, uh, their federal funding, if in fact they do, then the idea is for them to pay back the bridge loan so that we can in turn then take that money and, and help another uh, small business in need. If they're not able to pay it back uh, from their federal funding, then we're going to turn it into a longer term uh, ultra low interest rate loan of 1%. I think it's over uh, a, a, a three year period, but we have not uh, had anybody get to that point yet, obviously. So Kevin, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're, you're saying that this the this particular bridge fund is for people who have already applied for federal funding assistance. Is that correct? That would be the preference, but you know, if they uh, they call into the uh, hotline that uh, Kristen has been working very diligently on uh, and done a wonderful job at, uh, there are uh, personalized counselors there that can help them get started on that PPP application, uh, and mm -hmm. so they're really in the mix with the you know with anybody else that may not have begun. So we don't want to turn anybody away unless we absolutely have to. Kristen, can you speak to that? What have you seen and what have you heard and how are you handling that on your end? Yeah, so the helpline actually started April 2nd when um, there were, there was clearly a need um, for small businesses to get some assistance in making application for funding. Um, at that time, the um, state had opened up the Small Business Relief Fund that was through Iowa Economic Development Authority that had um, a um, March 31st deadline. And so um, actually the helpline started before April 2nd. Um, the week before we were helping with the state calls. The following week after um, that state application deadline closed, we realized our businesses still need help. Um, by that time, some of the CARES Act applications were opening up for the EIDL or the PPP program. And um, while many businesses were aware of that funding, they really wanted to talk with someone to wade through the information that was coming at all of us fast and furiously. Um, so our organization, Greater Dubuque Development, partnered with Northeast Iowa Community College. They actually host the Small Business Development Center for the Northeast Iowa region. Um, they share office space with us, actually, um, down in the Millwork District in Dubuque. Um, and so we realized that they just didn't have the capacity alone to take the calls that were coming in and to help the businesses that needed help. Um, we offered some of our staff, we offered um, some of our time and services to partner with NICC and the Small Business Development Center. As a group, we ended up with 12 counselors um, and that includes some of the staff from ECIA that are now working on this bridge loan program so that we could really customize help for businesses as they called in. So we, we went from helping with the state application to assisting with federal applications to answering questions about unemployment, um, answering questions about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which offers um, emergency sick leave and medical leave, to answering questions about PPE and safety practices in the workplace. Um, since since the call line began in March, we've taken um, calls from 438 businesses. Wow. And just since the bridge loan program opened this week, we've had about 50 to 60 businesses call. And um, just this morning before I got on here, they'd already received six calls um, to about the bridge loan program. So um, our goal with that program first was to target those unsuccessful state applicants. So the, the application was really modeled off that state application. Um, I believe we had about 360 unsuccessful applicants from Dubuque County for those state funds. So we really wanted to provide a lifeline to those businesses that did the work, qualified, um, but 
there wasn't enough funding to fund them all. Um, and then they maybe have applied for PPP, they may have applied for EIDL, but they're waiting for those funds to come through. Um, so I think this program that Dubuque Initiatives approved really fills a niche that we were seeing from the calls coming into the helpline. Wonderful. Is there anything else in terms of resources, Kristen, through the GDDC that you want to make the public aware of? Yeah, I would encourage people, um, especially businesses, to visit our website, um, greaterdubuque.org backslash COVID-19. Um, we are providing updates daily um, that are relevant to the business community. So federal funding, state funding, local funding, as well as new health guidance that's issued. Um, yesterday, I'm sure everyone knows by now that Northeast Iowa, um, there was a proclamation issued as we had reached a level 10 for state metrics and created some further restrictions and some further guidance for businesses. So we're really trying to keep the business community up to date. Um, not to be the first person to share information, but to be that person and that group that can really help them wade through the information that, as you said, to start can be very confusing and overwhelming. Thank you. And Kevin, from your perspective with Dubuque Initiatives, anything else that you would want business owners or community uh, supporters to know about that? Well, just that uh, it's working so far, Shelley. Uh, Kristen may have more updated numbers than I do, but as of uh, the end of the day yesterday, I think 26 businesses uh, locally had made application for the bridge loan and 14 have already been funded. And the remainder have, mm -hmm. are in various states of, uh, of processing and I'm sure you know, will be funded uh, shortly because our turnaround time is uh, 48 hours is our stated turnaround time to get the money in their account. And the only other thing is, uh, you know, we're all living in a different world right now than we were a couple months ago. And, uh, you know, for, our, I hope everyone exercises patience throughout all of this because, uh, you know, there, there's people that you wouldn't even think of uh, that you don't hear about every day that are working very hard behind the scenes. I know bankers are working mm -hmm. seven days a week around the clock. So. Uh, it, people do care, people do want to help, but uh, this is going to take some time to work out. Well, we appreciate your time and being here and everything that you're doing to help our community and the, the small businesses in the community and make an impact. And so thank you both for your time and for being here with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, we are going to discuss the health impact in Region 6, as Kristen mentioned, in the Dubuque County and beyond. So we will have some medical and health professionals come on back and join us. Thank you. Welcome back to the Tri-State Report. I'm Shelley Till. Joining me is Dr. Bobby Canero and Susie Stroud um, from the Board of Health. Uh, Dr. Canero, as a member of the COVID-19 Task Force in Dubuque County, yesterday, Kim Reynolds, the governor of the state of Iowa, determined that Region 6, which is Dubuque County, has been escalated to a level 10. What does that mean and what do we need to be concerned about? Yeah, so you know the state has been divided up into six regions and um, each of these regions has their own, uh, you know, metrics that we look at, uh, number of cases, things like that. So Region 6 uh, has uh, the highest uh, rate of, you know, rate of uh, cases that are coming on board. A lot of that is because of Lynn County, um, that, which kind of leads the pack. But Dubuque uh, falls under that region. So uh, because of that, uh, Region six is kind of viewed as a higher risk compared to some of the other counties in the state. So Governor Reynolds issued some st um, stricter measures and precautions that we need to, uh, to do now to contain this. And can you speak to what those uh, restrictions are? Because I know prior to this, we were still kind of in that social distancing, stay home, only go out if it's necessary. What escalates under this new order? Yeah, so it's really uh, just kind of amplifying the stay-at-home orders that we already kind of have right now, um, especially when it comes to interacting with other people. Really, uh, the, the take-home message now is, is really just interact with your immediate family. Uh, uh, 
don't go out and socialize with with friends or other contacts that you're not 100 percent sure you know where they've been um uh, so really it's about closing the loops that we're that we're associating with uh to another degree very good and i know that there is also um updated information now on coronavirus.iowa.gov uh, there's a dashboard showing specific more specific information if people want to go there but also, it talks about testing, and Dubuque County has listed as kind of outpacing our surrounding neighbors in terms of testing. What updates, and, and can you speak to that as what you, from what you've seen in the medical community determine around testing? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we have a sufficient uh, amount of tests in the community, and currently we're testing patients that are symptomatic, um, and, and that's been in line with what the state has been recommending and what the CDC has been recommending. Uh, you know, for the past several weeks, when we would do a test uh, with a, a swab, we would send that out either to the state lab or to Mayo Clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, now uh, within the UCL, uh, the UCL lab, which is shared between Mercy and Finley Hospital, we can now do a more rapid test in-house uh, in which we should get the results back uh, within hours instead of two to three days, which is, uh, you know, the, which has been the case when we're sending out the when we're sending out the results to the state or or Mayo Clinic. So that's that's really good. Uh, so so we you know so we we definitely have the capability now to test uh, in in large scale um, uh, as we have you know as we've been doing, but we're still sticking to the guideline of of testing uh, symptomatic patients. Okay, I was. That was. I uh, thank you for clarifying that because that was my next question. Have we gotten to the level yet where anyone can get tested? Do you foresee that as being uh, the goal, or are we still? Do you think it'll still stick to symptomatic only? Yeah. So you're talking about either test, you know, clinical testing or versus epidemiolo ep epidemiological testing, right? And they're two different things. One is really to test to make sure. Uh, that if someone is infectious, that we isolate them at home and that they're not further spreading the disease or the virus. Uh, epidemiological testing is, is different. That's to get a pulse on exactly how many carriers there are out in the community. We're not at that place yet. But if we are you know, moving on to the next phase of opening up the community at some point, mm -hmm. we will have to shift to some uh, to a different strategy where we, where we will be testing more. So that's that absolutely has to be part of our plan. We're, we're just not there yet. Okay. And part of that, obviously, is still with this social distancing, and there is, is now the Surgeon General has recommended when you're out in public wearing masks. And Susie, I want to bring you in on this, because I know that you're part of that mask task force. Say that five times fast. It's, it's difficult, <laughs> tell, I know. <laughs> yeah, what can you tell us about uh, what you're seeing and what you're, uh, what you're doing in terms of masks for the community? Um, well, this this came from, I live in downtown Dubuque, and it, there's a lot of foot traffic on my street. Um, I'm still seeing groups of teenagers get together that I know are not all living together and in the same family. I still see groups, nobody wearing masks. Um, so I, I, I didn't know if the information was getting out or if people didn't have access to masks or what, what the barrier was. So... Um, we, as the Board of Health, thought we should kind of be on the forefront of this and getting the information out in as many avenues as possible. So whether people are not on Facebook or don't have the internet at home, they can still get this information. So um, Dubuque Mattress um, Company had already been making masks and Key City Creative had already been cutting filters. So there were a lot of people already into this initiative. We wanted to collect the mask and get them out to people that may not be able to drive to Dubuque Mattress or may not have the information that these masks were available. So to get the most bang for our buck, we thought maybe utilizing some of the food distribution areas with the school district, giving um, grab and go meals to, to families and also um, Project Root It, which is in Dubuque, and Project Root It also goes to Western Dubuque and, and outside of the city of Dubuque. Um, 
so we have thousands and thousands of masks at this point. Point. Um, Key City Creative is um, holding them for us. We're sorting, organizing. We've already got 500 masks to project route it, 400 to the school district. Um, I gave another 300 to Stonehill this morning. We're going to do so. We're we're connecting to organizations to get these large numbers out. And once we do that, we're going to try to get a process together to hit people that may not use those resources and um, try to try to do that to where we don't have large groups congregating <laughs> and yeah. we can still do the distancing and follow all those rules but get get these masks into the people that need it that have to go out maybe have to go to work um, mm -hmm. you know you still got to do grocery shopping and stuff like that so let's protect our community as much as possible Wonderful, thank you for doing that and for sharing that information. And, and I think that the, the mask thing uh, still seems to be a little bit of a point of resistance for people. And Bobby, I know you've talked in the past um, when we've been on here about the importance of that for people who are asymptomatic because there are so many people out there who are. So can you just reiterate the importance of the mask? Yeah, so the mask, you know, really, it's such a low hanging fruit. It's really easy. It's an easy way for us to be able to, you know, reduce the spread of this virus. Uh, you know, we touch our face two to 3,000 times a day. So, you know, when we go to a play, a public place like a grocery store, um, where there's a lot of different people there, not only do masks, uh, you know, prevent you from or reduce you from touching your face, but also if you are a carrier that you're not aware of and you're coughing, uh, it could also, again, reduce the spread and, and uh, you know, limit the exposure to somebody else. Um, so you had mentioned, we, we touched on testing um, with, with United Clinical Labs, rapid testing is available. And I wanted to get back to your point, though, about opening up the economy, because I think people talk about the difference between health it's either health, your health or the economy, and it doesn't necessarily need to be that way. What is your perspective from your position on the board here? What is the best way, what is the plan going forward for our region, for Dubuque County, in terms of reopening some businesses? Yeah, so the good news is, is that I believe, you know, these social distancing measures that we've uh, done have, have really flattened the curve. Um, we haven't seen the numbers that we thought we would see uh, based on models, which is great. Um, and, you know, we're not at our peak yet. You know, we're expecting that to happen within the, maybe the next one or two weeks. Um, so once we, once we get past that and we start seeing that cases are flattening and even, re and, and, and even slowing down, our next priority has to be to, you know, opening up the economy. We need people to get back to work and, try to resume a normal life as, po as much as possible. Um, we're, this is not gonna be done fast. It's gonna be done stepwise through multiple phases. So, so we're, we certainly don't have a plan to do that yet, but we're, we're just uh, starting those conversations now. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, Bobby and Susie, both of you, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here and, and update us. And we appreciate your time. Stay well, and we hope to see you again very soon. Thanks for being here. Thanks, thank Shelley. you. You bet. Uh, coming up, we're going to discuss the impact to local nonprofits and the response from the community outreach in Dubuque County and beyond. Welcome back. I'm Shelley Phil here with the Tri-State Report. Joining me now is Danelle Peterson, CEO and President of the United Way, and Jenna Manders with the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque. Welcome, ladies. Thank you Hello. for having us. Thanks for joining us on this fun virtual uh, setup. We're, we're making things work, right? Just like uh, you are in your jobs, I know. <laughs> Let's start with um, the need. What, is, what are the current struggles and needs that you both are seeing in the community in terms of nonprofits? Um, I guess I can go ahead and speak to that. I know we've been having very regular discussions with our nonprofit uh, human service provider sector. So we've been having weekly calls with them. Um, as you can imagine, the needs are changing every single day. 
but um, at least having an area or an opportunity to have a touch point with all of us to talk together really helps. So our biggest needs that we're hearing from that group kind of has been and continues to be food. Um, so getting food into the hands of people who need it. Um, other concerns that we initially um, talked with our nonprofits about were needs around childcare and having questions regarding that as well as concerns about lost wages and how this will, of course, impact not only their nonprofits, but people accessing services. Um, many of those people who are typically accessing services um, could have some struggles, of their uh, financial struggles already, and then potentially losing their, um, their employment would obviously compound that. But we're also seeing a lot of new people who never used services before who need them now. Very good. How about you, Jenna, from your perspective? I would just build off of what Danielle said and add that um, we are, are particularly looking and concerned about vulnerable populations. Um, so with kids being out of school, they're not getting those meals that they would part usually get at school during the week. Um, so how are we getting lunches and even breakfast and maybe dinner to kids in need? Um, for seniors who might have been homebound in the past, they're probably still homebound, but how are they getting um, their needs met, not just through like a food pantry, but they still have other maybe prescriptions and other things that they need. Um, and a particularly also vulnerable population is immigrants. So what are we doing for our um, immigrant population that, to access the services that they need as well? Very good. Um, so as a result of that, I know you both are part of the uh, committee um, that has developed this discovery or excuse me, disaster recovery fund. Uh, can Danielle, I'm going to start with you. What was kind of behind this? How did this come together? And what is the purpose of this? Sure. Um, so yes, yeah, so the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque and United Way co-lead our um, community, it's a long title, Community Organizations Active in Disaster, which is why we just call it co-ed, it's way quicker. Um, we, started that about, <laughs> we started that about three years ago, just to plan for disasters in our community like this. Um, obviously, we, didn't, we typically think of disasters like tornadoes or um, floods, things like that, but this is certainly qualifying under disaster. Um, so our co-ed, has nine different subcommittees. One of those being um, our long range planning committee. And that committee helps determine um, when we would kind of engage our disaster relief fund. So fundraising efforts. And then they also help to decide how we will allocate funding out to other people, um, to nonprofits or to people in terms of um, those funds we get in, how we disperse them out. And I can let Jenna kind of take it from there. We've been working to prep for something like this for three years. Um, we've, we've engaged this disaster relief fund before. Um, it's an opportunity for us to work together to support the community. It's comprised of nonprofits, faith-based, um, lots of different people. But I'll let Jenna kind of take it from there about what we've been, do been doing since we've um, engaged that fund. Certainly. So we activated the fund actually on March 16th. So it's kind of like our one month anniversary right now. <laughs> and as Danielle mentioned, it's actually, um, we started the fund in 2008 and 2011 and raised money for some flooding happening at that point. Um, and there was some residual funds left over that we were able to use to address the, the straight line winds that we had in 2018 um, and some flash flooding we had in 2019. Um, but we definitely had to activate it again on March March 16th, um, and the county stepped forward actually right away and provided $200,000 to the fund. And we are able to use that to push 14 grants out to some organizations that we knew we were already partners with and they were gonna step up to do relief. As Danielle mentioned earlier, food um, access has really been our probably key priority for this fund so far. Um, so that's really who we look to grant to in the first round of grants. Um, then on and, March- Go ahead. I was just going to say, on March 23rd, then we opened the app, an application up to any nonprofit in our community to apply. To date, we've received 32 requests for a total of $730,000, and we've been able to fund um, 32 organizations so far with $402,000. So the need, um, the need is definitely greater than what we're able to address right now, uh, but our committee is mm -hmm. really trying to figure out what are those ne unmet needs for local, that local state and federal funding isn't, isn't addressing and that we can really re worry about right now with immediate relief. Thanks for that, Jenna. So, Daniil, where do people go if they want to help and want to participate in this fund? Um, well, certainly if people want to help by donating to the Disaster Relief Fund, they can go to the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque's website. 
um, that's where people can click the donate now tab. There's also nonprofits can go there to find um, the grant application. So if a nonprofit needs some assistance, they can apply for funding on that site. Um, if people um, in general want to help, um, a couple things I guess I could suggest if they want to help or have questions. We have the 211 information referral line that's available 24 seven. Um, it's a multilingual line too for people to be able to access to find out local resources that they may need themselves. So if they're wondering, where are those food distribution sites? How do I sign up for um, getting a food box delivered? I have questions about being exposed to COVID-19. Um, that 211 information referral line is where people should call and um, uh, get their information there. We have quadrupled the number of calls that have come in over the last um, month, of course, but we have staffed it with appropriate amounts of people, um, including some brain health specialists and some medical personnel too, to be able to address those needs. And that's 211 from a landline or 1-800-244-7431 from um, your cell phone. People could also text their zip code to 898-211 or download the free 211 Iowa app. That's another place to go. We also um, have on our uh, dbqunitedway.org uh, website, we also have a Get Connected portal for volunteerism. So if people are looking to wonder, how, how can they virtually volunteer? How can people uh, make masks? How can, what can I do while I'm at home to help? Um, our, it takes us a few minutes to create a volunteer profile if people haven't done that already. But you can also um, look through there to see what types of opportunities will be available for people volunteering, such as um, donating blood. We need people still to do that um, through the American mm -hmm. Red Cross. We need people to help uh, deliver meals if people are open to delivering meals with the Dubuque Area Labor Harvest, um, Salvation Army. So we have opportunities still for people to give back if they're if they're willing and able and people can even give back by making masks and things at home so not even leaving very good well ladies thank you so much for this incredible information uh, and helping us to get this out to the community and more importantly for all the work that you're doing to help people in the Dubuque community and beyond I really greatly appreciate your time today and stay well thank you you too thank you have a great rest of your day thank you well, we've been bringing you serious and very important information. And in this tri-state report, we always want to end things on a positive note. I am so excited to have Barry Gentry from the Dubuque Chamber of Commerce join us today. Hi, Barry, how are you doing? Shelly, hello, it's so good to see you. I'm doing good. Good, I will give you a virtual hug because I know you're a hugger. I am a hugger, Shelly, <laughs> I miss that. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing you're doing, I love this on your Facebook page, uh, you have started a thing called Berry's Bites to uh, highlight the area restaurants who are struggling in this difficult COVID-19 world we're living in. How did Berry's Bites come to be? Well, it wasn't my idea. Um, <laughs> I a colleague, the president, Molly Grover, said, Barry, you're not going to like this idea, but I want you to do a segment called Berry's Bites. And I said, well, I love to eat but I don't like to see myself on camera, but uh, we just thought we got to do something. You know, um, we can't stop promoting and the chamber we protect, uh, promote and serve our, our members and the, the restaurants and the bars are the ones who need it most right now. So there it is. So you pick a different restaurant every day and have either dinner or lunch from there. Is that correct? I do. I started um, with chamber members only first, and then we're going to, after we get through all those members, and of course, we'll we'll keep um, cycling through. Um, if I we're and we're still really busy at the chambers, so if I don't have time during the day, I do dinner. And uh, as you saw, the big calzone last night from Morocco. So uh, yeah, <laughs> um, whatever I have time for, it's usually lunch. So yes, I saw your huge calzone from Mario's. <laughs> and then, what are some of the other places that you uh, visited so far? Well, you know, some of my favorite uh, hangouts are Pepper Sprout and Brazen. So I've, of course, done those. Uh, Brazen's BLT was amazing. I just can't pronounce that bread that they serve it on. Um, it was, uh, <laughs> teach me how to spell it over online, but I don't, it doesn't sink in. I've went to, uh, you know, landmarks like the, the mining company. And I went out to Piasta because, you know, we're at Dubuque area. So uh, yes. I to Piasta to Trackside and I probably go over to Galena next week so anywhere and I do have to be in the mood for you know like I was wanting Italian yesterday so yeah it's just made sense so. <laughs> so what do we have to look up or look forward to well tonight I want some lobster bisque and hop I hear hops and rye has the best so
so I will let my uh, followers know. And um, <laughs> and then, you know, next week, um, I do kind of want to go down and maybe start sampling desserts, or not sampling, but getting desserts. And mm. mix up a little bit. And then after this is all over, we're going to keep doing this. And then oh, good. people want me to do Barry's beverages. But uh, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> that could create some problems. That might have to be an after hour show. Barry. Yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't be sampling that. That's for sure. <laughs> Where can people view your show? Well, it's uh, go to the Dubuque Chamber uh, Facebook page. And there's a group called I Heart uh, Shop Local. And if you can't find that, just email me uh, from the Chamber website. I'll hook you up. All right, Barry, thank you so much for being here and helping us end everything on a positive note. Great seeing you. Oh, it's so good to see you. Thank you for having me. You bet. Thank you for joining me on the Tri-State Report. Please join us every Friday for new episodes at 6 p.m. and re-airing again on Saturday at 11 and Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on MC22. Stay safe and we'll see you here next week. <laughs>